You're gonna be on the couch. Do you drink coffee and you just don't want it or you don't drink it? I don't drink coffee at all. People who smoke cigarettes but don't drink coffee is a rare breed. It is, yeah, yeah. It's fucking but the taste of coffee just I can't get it. I do chai latte. But you have tried a chai with one yeah, shot, chai, not yeah. two, one shot. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, my ex wife used to get those all the time, different chai to order. But you like the taste of a cigarette. I don't taste the cigarettes anymore. I just like the activity of it, I think. You heard it here first. He doesn't taste the cigarettes anymore. He just likes the activity. I know theme music. Real. real quick, theme music. I got I got to cut sure. the theme music. You just got to get cut off my ass for one second, and let me cut to the... Scoot, do, blabbity, blue, scoop, do. Jason Ellis's podcast. So I just came from Jason Ellis's podcast. Um, you know he is. He's the uh, he's like a pro skateboarder guy who had like a Sirius XM show for a long time. Still does a podcast, and uh, he's just cool. He's like an Australian guy. His like, whole head's tatted. He's so cool. <laughs> and uh, now he does comedy, which is great. And you're doing a press run, right? Yeah. Well, let's not bury the lead. We'll talk about more about it. But tell us about your special. Uh, it's called Dog Belly, filmed at uh, our festival, Skank Fest, we do in Vegas. Is anybody here wearing a butt plug? <laughs> <laughs> I believe them. I can't keep up with the pace of news for stuff I want to write about. Bill Cosby's already out of prison. He's out. I never wrote a joke about him going to prison. Because I'm still trying to process that Dr. Heathcliff Huxtable is fucking unconscious women crazy he got mad when Theo got an earring I've been called racist a lot I've been called a Nazi a lot too probably not the most but maybe the most of any other Jewish person in history <laughs> you think that means you can't be a Nazi I'm like yeah it's like the whole thing man it's like the thing At a place oh, called yeah. Notoriety. So Eric yeah, Griffin was, cool. was there, right? Yeah. Is that when you filmed the special? I remember he told yep. me about it. He yeah. said that your f fans are amazing. They are. They're great. They're great, great comedy fans. They're so like, uh, you know, I think a lot of people when we're booking uh, the thing through the years, like I think agents haven't brought them the offers because it's called Skank Fest. I get it. Hasn't brought who the offers? Comedians. I think comedians have had agents not bring the offers because it's called Skank Fest. Oh, so you... Wait, I'm tr still tracking levels. Here we go. So you don't ask comics. You have agents do it. You do a professional, like a professional. We role. have the people who run the festival, like right. uh, Rebecca Trent, Christine Evans, Shout and Lewis. And, Christine, yeah. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, th it's Lewis's, Lewis J. Gomez's kind of brainchild, and they execute it with him. And uh, it's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing festival. Yeah, and the fans, though, we've cultivated. People don't want to do it sometimes. They think it's going to be. Also, people have preconceived notions about like us and our brand of comedy and what we do. They think the fans are going to be like, you know, hate them if they're mm. a clean comic or going to hate them if they're this. And they don't. By clean, do you mean material or uh, material. xenophobic? Material. Material. Gotcha. Material wise. Yeah. Like they, it's not their. They laugh and love Nate Bargatze as much as they'd love the filthiest comic they could see. Who are some of the filthiest comics? They're just comedy fans. I'm pretty filthy. Because <laughs> you talk about your daughter's that, uh, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's there. We're going to, we just want to act like it's not there. <laughs> you know, there's, 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 there's this, there's um, this, there's this, uh, uh, I don't know if I call it a trope, but this, this uh, commonality among women where they discuss how men don't know where the clitoris is. And I think it starts with the fathers. Yeah. <laughs> they don't, they don't tell us. Yeah. I don't so know. I think if, what you're doing is wonderful. My dad taught me so much uh, or didn't teach me so many other things before where the clitoris is that we've never have gotten the clitoris. What was he teaching I just you? found out a couple months ago that he doesn't know how to throw a football, I think. <laughs> what does that have to do with the clitoris? Nothing, if, but if he couldn't teach me how to throw a football, he's not gonna teach me about the clitoris. You know, I, I totally understand the 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 A to C there, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, now I'm a cool guy. I, I could throw a... Sure, tight spiral. Yeah. People smart. are talking. <laughs> you, go, you, let, you let go like this. But I couldn't throw a spiral until my 20s. Yeah. Did you grow up with your dad? I did. Not an athlete? Yeah, I just didn't. I wasn't. I, I got into, I, I played basketball, but everything else. The only reason I played basketball is because that got me friends. Yeah. I wasn't into sports. Were you good at basketball? <laughs> Pretty nice. 
Because I think no. Rick Glassman has this great photo of him playing against LeBron James in high school, yeah, which is what? just an insane thing. Now, yeah. I heard he's really good. Rick's really good. If somebody told me that like he was, I think, playing a pickup game with someone, like somebody in entertainment, and they're like, hey, man, like you got to dial it back a little bit. Hit that, Baldy. Catch the fucking ball, dude. You're not aware of how other people perceive you. What are you talking about? Good take, you idiot. Ah. What? Are you not entertained? Got it! Let's go, let's go. Are you fucking nuts? I am phenomenal. I got big balls. I got a cool guy haircut. I got... I love that, though. This episode is sponsored by Helix Mattress. Andrew, you used to have a bad back, right? I broke it. I fractured it. And now... <laughs> I sleep like a king. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. The doctor said there's nothing you could do about it. You're going to be in pain. And then you slept on a Helix mattress that had a 100-night guarantee, risk-free warranty. Mm -hmm. And how many nights did it take before your back was fixed? One and a half. All right. That's helixsleep.com <laughs> slash Tyso to save up to $200 off your mattress and two free pillows. We'll tell you more later. <laughs> Santino, me, and mattresses go together like pumpkin pie. Hi, Glasgow and Boppers and TYSO Goblins. Next week, we're at our 200th episode, and we are under 5,000 subscribers away from 200,000 subscribers. I had a little idea. I thought I'd call in a favor. If you don't subscribe to this channel, go ahead and give it a subscription, because I'm thinking that if we could get to 200,000 subscribers by the end of the week of the 200th episode, I'm going to have the biggest boner. So... <laughs> Head on over to wherever it is where you press the subscribe button. And remember, if you do this for me, I'll get a boner for you. My name's Rick Glassman. Enjoy the rest of the episode. And we're back. <laughs> yeah, you know, I dabble. I dabble. <laughs> Some say I'm phenomenal. Um, Can you dunk? You know, I don't know now. Yes. But you have in life? Wow. Yeah, I just haven't played in like a year. That seems because to me. Because of some injuries. That seems to me like the best feeling in sports all around dunking. I've never gotten close. I was able to, when I was younger, slap the backboard, but I'll that's you. it. Six three. Today? Yeah. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> um, the best feeling that I, the, the what makes dunking so great, I have been fortunate enough as an athlete to dunk on people in games. Damn. And when you do it, when there's an, like there's people, and by people, I mean just the people waiting for the next game even. Hello. Blake. Okay. Hey, uh, no, no pressure. Uh, I'll clear it with you first. But uh, I'm on a podcast with Hassan Minaj. I don't know if you know Hassan. Uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, listen, he brought it up, not me. Okay, but he was asking me what it feels like to dunk and uh, on somebody, no, specifically on somebody, on somebody. And I told him, Why would he ask you that? Why he Blake? I said, Why would you ask me that? Because well, he's seen me play. I first asked him, Have you been able to dunk in a game? And he was like, Yeah. I don't know if he could hear you. Okay. Uh, listen, don't bust my balls now. Uh, uh, Hassan asked if I ever asked you that question. No pressure. But could you give us a soundbite of what it feels like to dunk on somebody? And congrats on the move. <laughs> um, um, I mean, if it's at home, it's, it's crazy because the crowd goes nuts and you just get like a kind of surge of adrenaline. But uh, on the road, I think it's even better because the crowd goes, oh. Like, it's like, oh, like. <laughs> Hopefully, a lot of ethnic people. That's the biggest reaction you're going to get. <laughs> I don't think that matters, Jay. <laughs> oh, it matters, Rip. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. What, what do you mean by But yeah, of course. Um, do you know Brent Morin? Mm -hmm. We have discussed, because uh, we were in a comedy basketball league for a while together, and <clears throat> we get a little, we're a little faster. I could jump a little higher when black teenagers are watching. Oh yeah, you put that oomph in. Yeah, because they are they're gonna get excited for you. You wanna you wanna show look at I I'm I'm cool. Yeah. As a big guy, my things I could show off, I'm like, time to show them that drop step. <laughs> drop step what? Uh just to the basket layup. Just go drop step yeah. yeah. And uh, you know, that's what the best I can do. It's not gonna be I'll try dribbling fancy. i for some reason I am so I'm the so far from ambidextrous that my left arm is almost useless. I might as well just got polio. It can't do anything. It's been grabbing the blanket this whole time. Know. I've been looking to see if we're getting under the blanket. It does It does the basic functions, but if you told me to dribble with it only down a court, it would look silly. Well, let's cut to a clip. 
<laughs> Stupid left. <laughs> I can palm a ball with my right hand, can't with my left. It's so I can't, uh, huh. I can't flex my left arm muscles. Do you have an injury? Like, no, it's just like my brain doesn't do it. <laughs> Um, have you tried starting to do things with your left hand that you normally wouldn't? No, I should. That's what I should. Well, now, because what happened was I played basketball nonstop as a kid, like through teenage years. It was like right after school. If it was winter time, you go to the rec center and Where'd play you grow up? in uh, Philly and then South Jersey. Um, gulp, gulp, gulp. Rec center right after school for pickup games. If it was summertime and if it was nice out, we'd go to the courts, play until they... Find courts where they turn the lights on so we could play at night. Loved it. That was a trick. You make friends with with the janitors and or people with keys. I always remember that. And we, uh, so we play constantly. And then, you know, life happens. And then we played for a little bit comics. What does life happens mean? Um, just I had a daughter. and at like 25, right? 23? Yeah, 24 when she was born. And like it's a, uh, you know, I mean, it's just like that. I couldn't like, there wasn't time to play like that anymore. And work, mm -hmm. you know, I have to do comedy i'm trying to do comedy and all this stuff i moved to new york away from all my friends anyway then for a brief time we all started playing in a story of queens a bunch of comics like joe list nate bargatze these guys we mm -hmm. play like every wednesday for a while and then when that just faded away it was years and years i haven't played and then i moved i got a covid deal and moved into a building that has an indoor full basketball court in the basement of my building uh in new york which is wow. awesome so now we're playing again and that gap in years has been uh -huh. crazy that's what that's the most thing where i've seen my age yeah just is like it, hit is it what is it thing you're not moving the same way things are hurting not moving the same what i found is a lot of people won't play that i invite and their whole thing is one they see tom segura mm -hmm. fall into a bag of bones on the thing and they all you know i don't have insurance or what i do what if i twist my ankle or break my ankle or hurt myself and i have hurt myself playing yeah. a few times now I've had a few surgeries. They've been, yeah, from basketball? I had to have a penis reduction a couple years ago. Yeah, that'll happen. That does get in the way. Mm -hmm. And shoulder and elbow. Turns out that wasn't why you weren't dunking anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it actually helped me jump a little higher. Thought gravity was weighing you down. Um, but playing again, yeah, that is the, the craziest, like, smack in the face. Like, the first game I know when we play, I'm going to have to deal with being lightheaded at one point because the heavy breathing just like not used to it anymore so it's fun it's been great to play again i do love that we're doing it and i'm starting to feel Is, myself you only get play back. With comics uh comics and like staff from like the network the podcast network and everything what so is like, that the, the uh, you talking about bonfire or, or no it's legion of skanks um it's a network well, tell me how that works what does that mean gas digital network so lewis shout out to guess so the yeah, same yeah. the same people who uh like lewis is you know my partner on legion of skanks who um also is the brain sorry the, the mastermind of skank fest well, he's just smart he's a good business guy with that stuff too aside from being hilarious he's like he just saw it like you know when he sees people do like all things comedy like when they did that and uh anthony kumi has started a network after opie and anthony ended and he was just like yeah i'll start a network you know with like the people who we like and think are funny and is that your bread and butter now over. or is it touring touring i guess is always the thing but i think they feed each other so well like broadcasting and touring is the ultimate you know mix. i guess you know there's so many comics who have acted in a lot of things who still don't sell tickets you know what i mean because they have a lot of these cool little parts yeah but starring in tv certainly affects your like road you know feeds the road maybe yeah. for sure but just like doing the road just you just do comedy now and don't have any audience from broadcasting it's hard to promote the term broadcasting i don't hear too much anymore and when i do i think of do you know the movie uhf with weird al yeah, yeah. where he goes broads don't belong in broadcasting <laughs> sweetheart take my advice broads don't belong in broadcasting did you see the weird al movie yet no i heard it's funny i didn't see it did, did with, 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 harry Daniel potter Radcliffe? plays him isn't that crazy? Even when you talk about another movie, you call him his character name. Right, Harry Potter? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Harry, was it Daniel Radcliffe? Yeah. Um, people get typecast. You know? Sure. I mean. As a sitcom actor myself. Go, go, go. <laughs> look at my headshot. They, I just, people always think of me from, from one of my first main shows. Oh, look at that. Yeah. 
That's good. It's a good That's picture. Good. It's yeah. just, you know, it's hard a lot to get of people out can't of pull off fully shaved and you're nailing it. It makes me look a little younger. <laughs> um, I want to know about, uh, talk to you about when life happens stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you were in Philadelphia when you got may a woman, a woman pregnant. No, 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 no. That was New York. It was actually very, the way it tied in was so interesting. I uh, started dating a waitress from the comic strip comedy club in New York. I was still driving up from Philly. What's every that, day. a two hour drive? Two hour drive. Every day to do shows? Like six days a week, yeah. You were driving? Not even just do shows, sometimes just to like be around it. And Would you stay in the city? Show our faces, no. We didn't have anywhere to stay in the city. You would drive two hours. Well, I was doing it the first two years, it was me, Keith Robinson was the guy who mentored um, who's a great comic, mentored me and Kevin Hart and brought us up from Philadelphia together. Mm -hmm. And um, we were going up all the time. Kev pretty quickly got the call to go to LA. Guy from um, Jumanji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jum Jumanji happens, yeah. you know, life, Jumanji. No, he started getting some stuff and moved out to LA really quick. And then when I started dating, what's now my ex-wife, we were, uh, I was driving up by myself because if I went with Keith, you kind of got to be beholden to like, he wants to leave and go back to Philly and I might want to hang out with this mm -hmm. girl. So I stopped going and I was doing it by myself a lot. And that, when 9-11 happened. On 2000, it, 2001? 2001. Or? Right. It, now that two hour drive was like four and a half, five, and like three to get home at night. And it was just impossible. So I had to kind of hastily move to what New York. What made it more, I would think less people are trying to come and go. No, well, I mean, you know, the work still had to happen. So many, right. but even if it was slightly less people, let's say they made it where before you can come in from New Jersey, you can come through Staten Island, you could come through uh, Holland Tunnel, Lincoln Tunnel, or George Washington Bridge. It's like four points of entry. And they stopped to one lane in the Lincoln Tunnel was mm -hmm. the only way in and out of New York. So they wanted to, and also they're stopping every box truck and everything that's going through. Right. So it just became, I was like, I'm gonna have to stop coming to New York and, and lose my momentum here or move there. Right. So in a way, 9-11 made you move. It did, no, for sure. And so- you, we yeah. uh, we me and my uh ex got a place together with kurt metzger and his girlfriend at the time and we all moved in together and just living together in three months of living together she was like i'm pregnant and i was like ah oh here we go and then so yeah that kind of like it's it that stifled my career is the wrong way to put it i was it definitely slowed it down because i had to support like with immediate money and I couldn't really do the, I, it took me forever. When I was already, you know, doing well, as far as like, I was in the clubs in New York. And like you're 24 at this point. All the clubs, well, I mean like, yes, I was 24 and I was starting to work the clubs in New York. And even like, as my daughter got a little bit older, like, you know, four, five, six, I was doing it in New York as far as like, I can work pretty much every night of the week and on the weekends make some actual money mm -hmm. running around doing spots. But I had no ability to be like, so I'm gonna go make no money for the next two months and go to LA and like couch surf with a buddy. And I always and that had to would, have money. That would help your career how? Um, I don't know if it would have because of what it is that I wanna do and how I'm kind of like the direction I go with it. Like I'm very drawn to stand up. Mm -hmm. So coming out here didn't really overly matter to me anyway because I wasn't, didn't think I was gonna be an actor or a sitcom, but I also just couldn't, I was also an unknown out here. But how did it stifle your career, stifle your career then? Because I had to make, I wouldn't have come out here and made money. So before I would be able to go to New York to take, or to LA, to take like a chance on maybe I'll pick up like a role on a sitcom or that's something. That's what I was saying. So that's what you would have done. You would have tried to have acted more. Oh yeah, probably. Because I was just told that's what you're supposed to do. Right. I'm kind of happy it worked out the way because I was able to find it. But what I was just saying was weird about it, like the, the slowing things down so much. When I was in my mid thirties, I'm 45 now. In my early and mid thirties, I guess early to mid thirties, coming out here and, and already being a working comic steadily, like one of the staples in the New York scene, I'd come out to like the Laugh Factory, the comedy store and like, you know, I may get one spot and then the manager would have to watch me and say if he's gonna book me again. And uh, you know what I mean? It was like the process starting all over again, yeah. 15 years in the comedy almost. So that was kind of funny. I wonder if I'm gonna feel that way. I wanna start coming into New York more. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just went and had Dan Soder on. Uh, uh, I was there, we did, uh, did six, I did six episodes. I love New York 
comedians. Oh yeah, the hang's great. Love. And I want to be there. I want to go there for even if a month or two. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, I'm not in any of the clubs. I have enough friends that I think will help me out. Bobby Kelly said he'll help me out. Oh, um, nice. But I was thinking like, oh, I, I know I know here. Mm-hmm. I don't know there. You know LA. I know LA. Yeah, it's so interesting. I have such the opposite mm-hmm. feeling of that. Like I, you know, I, I thought even this, I was, I finished up the podcast I did before this, just they went long. Mm-hmm. And I wrote, I was like, I... And there's no way, because I mean, everything I did yesterday just happened to be like 45 hour long drives that aren't distances, like 12 miles an hour drive. Yeah. So that's when I was like, oh, you're gonna have to tell Rick, I think I can't do this. And they were like, no, you happen to be seven minutes away. Oh, it's close. And I was like, oh, thank God. Yeah, it was also. I'm sweet. also flexible as shit. <coughs> oh, oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, that's uh, smoking. So you, um, you have a kid. And now you said you need immediate money. How did you get immediate money if stand-up wasn't giving it to you? No, it was. But I had to do the, uh, I did the black circuit a lot uh, is where I started. So I always still had were my you, feet. Were you jumping a little bit higher and running a little faster? <laughs> no, but I was definitely wearing uh, more jewelry and more FUBU jerseys. <laughs> really? Did you oh, feel you needed to? I pandered for sure. Were you doing that to be liked more or yeah. were you? Yes, that's yeah. the reason. I even cultivated my comedy. I always said it wasn't a total sellout ultimately because I never did jokes that I didn't think were funny, at least when I wrote them, whether they stink or whatever in hindsight. I was always like, this is funny. But I knew I I played to an audience where I chose my... I didn't really change my vernacular very much. I really did. My vocabulary never like went hip hop. Mm -hmm. But I genuinely did like hip. I wasn't wasn't like faking that, but like... I just put a little more on like dressing the part and looking the part and maybe having like the delivery or swagger of the part. You know, you know, Kurt Metzger is, I assume, right? Kurt started there with me also in the black circuit. Uh And it was funny to watch because he didn't pander at all. He had these great jokes and he would just have a hard time with them a lot because the black crowd was just right away like, this guy's wearing khaki pants. I, I don't. I, 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 not to negate that, but I, my experience, I've never, I don't think it matters what you, what you wear. It doesn't, or, matter, it doesn't matter what you wear, what it is. And, and this is hindsight at this point now was um, it's when you're showing up what a black crowd will do, especially like, you know, like a real, like promoted show. It's very like a hip hop show. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? DJ like, on the stage. Yeah, I love them. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And what's great is fun is to go back and do uh, black shows now when I do them once in a while. It's fun to go back because I love doing well, being very much myself. Uh-huh. And what it is is uh, why the pandering was easier and why Kurt didn't do good with great jokes is because they saw fear. I think it wasn't what, the joke. I think what a black crowd wants is like, I paid money to be here. Like, you should make me feel like you're supposed to be on the show I'm watching. Uh-huh. And if you're not almost because of the Apollo and shows like that, there's like a built-in thing to be like, and if we don't like you, we're going to be like, get him out of here. Do you know what I mean? It'll be a kind of a great, but when if they you do, go, but if you, you go they up, do like you though, there's nothing, there's no, uh, there's no energy yeah. like a black room. You're absolutely right. I mean, I've done P Diddy's bad boys, of comedy and BET's mm-hmm. comic view. And yeah, for sure. But as it's so much more rewarding, like I used to have bits that were so, geared towards like just getting this black audience could you give me an example that would, oh yeah i used to get down hold to, on lights <laughs> i used to get down to my underwear on stage doing a joke about bodybuilding and not my underwear tiny tiny little bikini underwear that are for this thing and the joke essentially if you boil it down is fat guy in a bikini underwear <laughs> you know everyone's laughing at fat guy in bikini underwear, but i was just like the feeling though when i did it and it would just, I mean, punching tables and laughing and, mm-hmm. you know, falling out of their seat is so, it's such an electric feeling. But I said, it's, it's going back and doing it now, sitting on a stool, doing kind of like what I do for 20 some years now. It's it's so much more rewarding having them really like me being myself. It's cool. But I didn't know how to do that in the beginning. I was just like, yo, I want to kill like all these guys. I better fuck this stool and start doing whatever. If we had more time and a budget for this, I would want to cut to a clip of you being yourself sitting on a stool in this black room, but you are naked just in this little underwear. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, you're still doing the same thing, man. 
they got, it was funny. I was so locked in to believing that's how it had to be to do well that when somebody eventually talked me out of doing that bit, mm -hmm. like it was Keith Robinson actually, is it who's like, was a vet at that point and in the mainstream scene. Marines? Also, yeah. <laughs> he, uh, in, in like, uh, he said to me, he's like, ah, oh, you're funny. You know, he was, he was mentoring me. He's like, you're funny. You're very funny, but like, be funny with your words. Like, what is it you're, you're getting? He's like, anybody who's not in great shape, it's funny. And you're, the, jo the joke is you're a fat guy in underwear. He's like, it's not really comedy. It's not really like what it is you want to do. Like, you want to say the funniest jokes. And I was like, yeah, kind of like God ends me like that. And by the next week, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that bit anymore. It's too much, whatever. Then I did a couple shows. I think, oh, this is still open mics pretty much. And I'm doing open mics where I'm not doing great now or the produced shows or the black shows where it's not, you know, I'm not feeling that. Like, even if I have a good set, I'm like, man, where is that, like, explosion, that mushroom cloud of, like, cheers and laughter that I'm used to getting with that well, getting naked bit. I do feel that, like, being in underwear using props is a little bit of a cheat. Yeah, yeah, it can be. And um, so I, by the couple weeks of just doing okay with jokes or not good and not having that big explosion at the end, I my next one, I only did it once, but I'll never forget. I, I took a piece of string and put it around my neck on my, mm -hmm. like, uh, on my body and taped it uh, right above, like down right above my nipples with a, a little bit of extra string Nipple hanging string. off. Yeah, classic nipple string. CNS. And we, uh, and what I did was when I was getting ready to go on, they said I was next. I went in the back and I made two giant tin foil rings and I tied them to it looks like they're giant, crazy nipple rings. Mm -hmm. And I could, you know, I don't even remember, I couldn't tell you one of the jokes I had back then or the set. And I just, at the end, I just need that explosion. And I was like, non sequitur, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, you know, that's why my mom's that person. And uh, oh, guys, by the way, before I get out of here, uh, I got a new a couple new piercings. Like, tell me if it's too much, and I just lift the thing. And again, it's right back to. But what's the, why not do that? Why can't you do that? Is it cheap to you? It's not that you. It's not that you can't. There's people who do prop stuff and physical. I, I like uh, off the uh, like off the track like comedy of just the basic ho hum telling your stories or jokes. I do like that. It's not what my thing. Do you know what I mean? It's just not my. But thing. it was. I was. You did it. You liked it. No, I didn't. I thought it was. I, I was like, "What's the thing that's gonna work?" It wasn't like, "Yo, right. how funny is?" It? I would have loved to right. have. But again, starting at nineteen, which I started young, that's another thing. I forgive myself for a lot of those, and they're funny stories till now. I had no life experience to yeah. talk about. I've been a babysitter for my brother and sisters, and I lived at home with my mom. How many? You can only do so many jokes to that. I have uh, a brother and two sisters from my mom and stepfather and my dad has two sons so you have my five stepmother so five siblings yeah. all younger all younger yeah significantly how old are think. what's the youngest the youngest is let's see she should be 11 19 years younger than me so she is 26 26 yeah close to, closer to your daughter's age than you oh yeah 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 for sure yeah well i said i moved out of my mom's house where i was like the babysitter in my the youngest one was a, a baby, mm. essentially still, maybe two or three years old when I moved out. And then uh, I had my daughter, like I said, months later or, you know, a year later. So the way you said you were living with your friend and, and your partners, the four of you, it makes me think of my grandparents when they were, um, they're older than you. And okay. they uh, were in New York and that's what it was. It was like, you live in like duplexes and like all the families all live together. My grandpa and grandma, my grandpa's brother and her, his wife, yeah, yeah. they all live together. I'm picturing, I'm just picturing you in like newsies shit just <laughs> because of that. But like you go there and you're a kid, literally a kid, you have a kid. Um, I want to understand the, uh, the, uh, there's a, a drive for us to do a dream and art and expression. And then there's a drive uh, for us to uh, survive. Mm -hmm. um, and when it becomes an art form that is by design about you, but the business side is far removed from just you. In fact, it might even not even be thinking about yourself. No. Um, how, how does that change what you're writing about? Like this, like real quick, I don't mean to lead mm -hmm. it, but sometimes I'll go up and I have something I want to talk about. Sometimes I'll go up and I'm just in the silliest mood and I want to be silly. Sometimes I don't want to go up, but this is the job and that's what you do. Um, the third one is the worst one. Sure. 
out of those three, does you know? Do you know what I'm asking? Like, where does the priority lie? Like, how much, how much is what you're doing still expressing yourself, or does it change because it had to? Oh well, no. In the beginning, I said the what I was loving, even with pandering and, and able to kind of get through like the creative block of it. You know, I feel again. I didn't even know. What, you're right. It's almost that I didn't know even what it is I wanted to do. I and everything has these kind of milestone moment like changes in everything i was doing like i was doing the, the black circuit for a while and then we started getting into the mainstream rooms and then i was Who's watching we? uh me kevin kurt metzger your philly group yeah, yeah and we're coming up and we're getting in and i you know that was kind of interesting was kurt metzger was able to assimilate very quickly into that because he was like oh wow a crowd's kind of just like this timid crowd now it's a timid crowd mm -hmm who's like, I'm controlling that. He mm -hmm. felt that immediately and like his jokes are good and and they're giving him kind of that time to let him develop. They didn't need something like out of the gates big or, you know, explosive. And I was going up in front of these same two in the morning, whoever's left in the Boston Comedy Club. With nipple strings. Se seven people. No, not not with nipples. I, did, I, did, I knew already by that point not to do those things, but I still just had a a handful of like, Yo, P. Diddy, uh, don't even, you know, P. Diddy puts himself in every song, you know, just things that don't make. Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, I guess these two Slovenian people in the front <laughs> row don't get it exactly. Uh -huh. And it would be like, you know, like I would, I'd feel it. So I had to make a lot of like. What's then, the umbrella guy's name? Uh, Fonsworth Bentley. Yeah, yeah just, uh, just I got eight minutes on Fonsworth Bentley. Yeah, for sure. I definitely <laughs> mentioned Fonsworth Bentley. I, had, you know, you can't have a superhero in the hood and just like concepts like that. Then when I was uh, going through New York, and I was like starting to get in a little bit and do okay. Don't uh, don't glass over that. What does that look like? What does that mean? Um, I just started to get my feet under me a little bit, and I had jokes that I was able and, to like. And you're so, getting booked? And some stories, and I'm saying I'm also living life now. It's like, oh, I moved to New York. I've got some things to talk about now, some life experience. You know, I'm getting a little, I just had a daughter, you know, I'd talk about that. Uh, but clubs are having you in now, mm -hmm. and, and, and you're getting paid? Yeah, and but getting slowly but spots. surely. No, not good spots yet. Kind of like the late night things and just starting to crack in. At what clubs? But uh, the first was the Boston Comedy Club, Comic Strip, and Caroline's. Those were the first three that kind of embraced me. Then a few years later, the Cellar, Stand Up New York, and mm -hmm. all those. But um, when, yeah, when we first came up, I was uh, start. I said I was starting to get through the clubs a bit and get in there. But not having like my own like it was just like observational jokes, you know. It's a funny thing. Oh, I, a lot of it was like, "Hey, uh, you ever watch that show that has that?" You know, it was just kind of like, "Like, have you ever tried this product?" Sure. This episode is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Do you know what the difference between that first noise and the second noise was? The first noise was like I was making fun of you, and the second one was I was starting a car. That's why I recommend Helix Sleep. Also. Jokes aside, got them for my family. I use them. My cousin Teddy just got one. Um, they're a great mattress. Putting the jokes right back in. Plus, they're good to f*** on. <laughs> okay, take them out for a second, okay? <laughs> because you can go to helixsleep.com slash Tyso to save up to $200 off your mattress order and get two free pillows. Also, I got to say, the shipping is very expensive. You know that, right? I mean, Always. they're mailing a mattress. Yep. Psych. Free shipping. What? Brought straight to your door. What? The problem is the mattress is so cumbersome and weird. How are you going to get it even inside? Yeah. Psych. Easy. It's in a little box. So they you... fold it up in a little baby box. Yeah. The problem is though, if you don't like it, you only get twenty days to return it. And you got to pay to ship it back. Oh, psych. Three psychs, and, <laughs> and you're, you're out. out. <laughs> and three psychs, and you're out of luck if you don't pick up one of these mattresses because you get a hundred day risk free trial. So let's go to helixsleep.com slash Tyso to save up to two hundred dollars off all mattress orders and two free pillows. And you get two free pillows. That's Helix Sleep. Helix Sleep, helixsleep.com. Tyso slash Tyso. <laughs> okay. Should we go back to the app? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Watch my new one hour special that drops March 21st on my YouTube page at youtube.com slash Jeremiah Watkins. Is that Rick approved? Yeah. Send me that too. When does it come out? Uh, March 21st. Mm. These are good. I don't even know what vegetables I'm eating, to be honest, but they taste good. They're just random root vegetables. I don't know why there's carrots and other roots. 
And we're back. I was having life experiences, so the the jokes were probably getting a little more relatable and better, mm -hmm. I think. But then um, storytelling shows started popping up, and these comics were asking me their storytelling shows. And I love that they always, I always remember they were like, you don't even have to be funny. Mm -hmm. It's not it's just a story. You gotta have an interesting story. But I was by nature, I'm always gonna try to tell a story. And it gives you one. permission to to kind of expand and breathe. It made me feel I like, like those, I didn't have to too. have a laugh every couple seconds at mm -hmm. least. And I loved that energy because I knew I'm like, well, this is a good story. So it's like when yeah. we get there. And then organically, because I feel the pressure, and that's how I think I operate in that. If I see the audience not laughing and I'm just talking, I know there's like I'll say a little side a side thing here, you know. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, you didn't feel the pressure to make people laugh at the shows, but the, so it could be long form, but yeah. it was fun. And then I would go do those shows and then go around the corner to the comedy clubs and try the story there. And, and I liked that. So then I started becoming my first comedy. I was called an American storyteller. It's all long form stories, but not being on the road headlining at all, not being able to put asses in seats and not having like a, uh, an LA thing where I'm going out on a road. I'm in these clubs some months, every day of the month, you know, I'm around. And mm. what I started noticing is the other comics who were kind of like, not stuck, but just in the clubs and at the clubs all the time, committing to some of them that commit to like the same bit or the same set forever. I'm, I'm confused, stuck in the club versus what? Uh, on the road, a, headlining. J-Lo J -Lo song, isn't it? <laughs> stuck in the club. Um, I mean, stuck in the clubs by like, not touring. I'm not touring. Yeah, there's right. no uh, there's no road money, no anything. I'm just opening sometimes for people, but yeah. I'm but I'm getting the work. And uh, damn it, not it's changing their act stuff. Um, yeah, well, I was doing yeah, with the comics who don't change their acts very much. I one time just remember watching, you know, this comic got the light, and notoriously, when he gets the light, he just starts doing the last bit that he always does. You know, um. And I watched the wait staff walk by and like roll their eyes and mouth the words of the thing. Mm. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's happening mm. to me because I they're hearing these same long yeah. two or three stories every time. So then I hated that. And I always wanted to be, because I thought the coolest thing was when Patrice and Geraldo and Attell yeah. go on stage, I see the staff try to stop working. I see the other comics kind of trickle in or stand out and sort of watch them. So and I love that so much. Me. So then I, what I started doing was so the this audio, I started performing solely for the staff by going on late night and just talking to the crowd and just- Pros and cons up. of that. I want to get, talk about that for a second. Tell me mm -hmm. the pros and cons of doing that and that choice of doing it for the audience, uh, doing it for the wait staff, uh, prioritizing that over the audience. Um, Nothing. I think one fed the other completely because it kept me in the moment. I wasn't just going up there and- doing my job of punching in, yeah. here's my five things, and then I leave. It kept me, I'd go to the host. Hey, uh, Artie, you've been here all night. Like who, oh, these two people are from Australia, but I don't think she likes them. I think she's here for the free trip. And uh, this couple, and he just give me that, so all those premises to work with. Um, so, and it, it, that was, and, and I was, that I was able to develop jokes or find new stories even just off of the interaction with people and i liked that. and then i would just kind of pocket the long things for when i have to record or headline something or whatever and i found that to be that was kind of my niche my my interest in that is because for the longest time i felt like a liar i know if i've heard other people talk like this or or cheating uh by re repeating material um i hated Me doing too. it and um i had a, a boss of mine oh there he is say to me because he saw me do this bit uh once and then he never saw me do it again he goes how much can we don't do that bit anymore and i said because it works like i did it yeah. already um he's like no do it and i was like yeah and i'm still conflicted me too if i have someone i know because i do a lot of crowd work but especially like now i'm trying to build another hour because i that's the thing. I'm That's why you special. have to repeat. So you, you have to. So I, but even if I only have, and I do right now, I have like four, five maybe premises that I can dick around with mm -hmm. on stage. A lot of my fans, because I do so much crowd work, and they're diehards. You know, they're, they're like, so they. I'm, see I'm coming. Lot. I'm coming tomorrow. Right. Uh, we're here tonight. I'm bringing my dad tomorrow, and then me and my girl are coming on, uh, you know, Saturday. And even though I know they don't care, 
they, they don't, don't care what if you repeat, they don't care if i repeat they want to they want their dad to hear that right. thing i said earlier if i see if i know when they tell me that i'll always be like what show are you coming to you know the seven o'clock and i'll be like all right well i'm gonna not do yeah that isn't that crazy piece. yeah I'm somebody that you don't even know you know that they heard it and it, it affects you from being present i won't have the whole other crowd who maybe hasn't seen it i won't let them hear it now because i'm like i don't want that guy but that's to a think bad thing right that i it is. I connect. I get that. It is a bad thing. It's not well. It's a bad pressure to put on yourself unnecessarily. Can I ask th that? To, uh, it doesn't matter. What does if that goes on the floor? Your bag that's yeah. on the floor now. Mm -hmm. If you put that on floors at restaurants and stuff, could you keep it up on put it on? Oh, the I don't put it. I would never put it on the floor of a restaurant. Okay. But I'll still. If it's, no, no, no. If it's not a floor bag, you sure? Okay. Yeah. Um, this thing where we need to do different stuff all the time, I think comes from something within us maybe similar maybe different but there's something outside of stand-up where and i'm still trying to figure this out why do i feel like i'm lying or why do i feel it's bad to lie in this situation because that's what it is the first time you the first several times you told it that joke you had a passion for it and a part of you was kind of like oh man like they're about to hear the part right like the part's coming up and you know you have that excitement to it eventually it becomes like a part of the machine mm -hmm. you know you're building and it's the craft and it just kind of yeah and it's fine and it goes like that but that's exactly it you're like when uh when you have to put it in an inflection of like you know here's where i pause and i kind of mm -hmm. laugh at myself a little bit before i say the next line and by the time you're doing oh, that, you're that tight by the time your you're doing that on uh like muscle memory or just memory you're like I'm not giving them the thing. It's uh -huh. like I should be in the moment. When I first started too, same thing. My first probably five or six at least open mics that I did, all different, 100% different things. And then someone goes, why are you not doing that thing you did the second week or whatever? You know, it was, That was a shitty joke too, I'm sure. But like, why are you not doing that? I go, oh, I did it the other week. And they go, yeah, that's how you do comedy. You have to like, you're building a set. And I was like, Oh, I thought I'd just go up every time and like, hey, I thought of these things this week. I thought of these things this week and yeah. just do those. But you're still were, like that. I mean, it's still I, in I, your I, head. I've, it was, it was funny. It got so scripted for a while that it's been like a, you know, it's like a, a, a cyclical journey to get back yeah. to like the funny that I was in the beginning. Because when I wanted to do comedy, it was based, my funny that I was, this is an interesting thing Patrice said to me a long time ago that I thought was interesting. Uh, a moment of realization for comedy it was like when your friend if you're a funny person around your friends which most of us were funny in life to some degree mm -hmm. uh the reason we got into doing this you didn't overthink that like when you're like we're meeting up with our friends you just assumed the role of that because you were like you weren't like okay my friends are coming over to pick me up all right uh jimmy i'm gonna make this joke about a shitty car mm -hmm. and then i'm gonna tell steve about his shirt and when, you didn't you just <laughs> when you did it you were like you know nice shirt whatever thing you say to him and bust his balls nice you shirt just, comedy you were just, yeah um you didn't overthink it and he was like you just kind of accepted like you're like you were confident enough without even thinking about it they're like yeah i'm the funny guy i'll yeah. say the funny things and he was like walk on stage almost with that same kind of like confidence we were like and it is that's almost a thing where you look at the crowd and you go i'll get it i'll figure it out yeah i'll keep if i keep talking like i'll find the thing you were saying a cyclical where you would do different stuff all the time, but then you're so scripted that even your pauses are where they're supposed to be, and you're trying to go back to here. Um, what is it when you're when you're when you're being too loose? You're like, I need more structure, yeah. and then too much structure. Do you think that you'll keep going cyclically, or do you are you trying to find that equilibrium to where you have both, or I'm is it day to, to day? Equilibrium. I'm trying to find the equilibrium for sure. Like I know and you've been doing this for, since you were 19. Yeah. So 26 years and you're still trying to find the equilibrium. Is yeah. it, is it, does it exist? I don't know because again, it'll say the same. I've been called like, yeah, the guy's got no jokes. So it's like, great. He does crowd work the whole time. And it's like, no, it's like, I have the jokes, but that show was just like, yeah. the crowd was wacky. So I was able yeah. to like get a bunch of stuff out of that. And then some people, you know, you do a set, he goes, oh, you didn't really talk to the crowd at all. And you're like, yeah, I have these new bits, so I want to make sure I get them all out. And like you said, you're going to be slave to it either way, the the judgment from it. So you can't make all the people. I'm, I'm trying to get better. That's what I'm trying to find the the balance on is accept the kudos and the hate almost with the same, like, thank you. Oh, that's that that's an easy one for me. Yeah. That's a very easy one for me. Um, 
I mean, it, it, for, and for better and for worse. I mean, when people laugh or like me and I don't think that set was good, I don't believe them. Oh, yeah. Um, and if they think that it wasn't and I thought it was, it's like, oh, they, they're wrong. It's so however I feel. And I, I've kind of oh, lucked good. into that. That's, that. That is lucky because I said I, I can be shaken. I would learn with those, like the Reddits and those kind of things. We read this horrible stuff. I'm an insecure person. So as soon as they get mm -hmm. like, it's all smoke and mirrors. He just, uh, you know, asks this question and then says, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I am a fraud. But it is. <laughs> I go right to it. He goes, but, yeah. But it is smoke and mirrors. It is. I yes, mean, this magician is. did it with smoke and with mirrors. And that's why it worked. Yeah. I mean, it is. There's also. Well, I call it a manipulation. I think it's the ultimate manipul manipulation. And that almost goes back to what I said with the black audiences. Because you can fake it, into, which is almost what I was doing. They thought I was really confident because I knew if I did these over the top, taking my clothes off and jokes about mm -hmm. hip hop music, they would like me. But you know what I mean? Like it was it was more like that was like the lying thing of it versus like being yourself and just kind of. I have I have a, so many opinions on that, and we don't have to dive too much into it. But that thing of your smoke and mirrors that you were doing because they would like you. What call it an energy? Call it props? Whatever it is, that silly thing mm -hmm. that was forced. You thought they made him like you, but um, my take is it wasn't the nipple piercing or the underpants that they liked. It was, it's energy. Mm -hmm. It's just your broad, your or your slapstick or your satirical or you're parodying something or you're just, you know, lot, whatever it is. There's like, that's just fun. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's you or it, or it doesn't mean it's always you, but I think there's something to fun doesn't have doesn't mean it's funny but there's sure. just a, my mom is very funny but she also has this energy where it's just like i want to i like it just a fun lady and when you like it it's so much easier to be funny yep i think there's 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 at least two and it might just be two tricks there's fun and they're not mutually exclusive mm -hmm. there's fun and there's present and I think those are two tricks that like, if I don't know what to say or I'm nervous or I need to say something different, what could I do? Well, either I could come in with a big energy and I know how to do that because you, those are the type of jokes where it doesn't matter if you're on autopilot because right. they're very performance based. Mm -hmm. So it fit, it works. It works the same way if you're in it or you're not. It's sure. just works. There's music, there's lights, whatever. And the other version is just being completely present. And it doesn't mean it's funny, but it lets you be honest. Yeah. And if you're present, at least they're engaged and they believe you. I think those are two smoke and mirrors. It's or, a good word, too. Believing you is a big, big thing. I've heard musicians say that about other musicians. About believing them when they I, watch them? That I thought, you know, I, was like, I was like, I remember being on tour with bands, and I said to one band that was watching, a, a band that was like uh, with me the whole tour, there was like a, a one-off band on the tour that uh -huh. day, and I thought they were a little like, silly i thought their thing was kind of like goo. i didn't get it so much and i went over to those guys who now i'm buddies with at this point and i'm like these guys right and they go yeah the music's a little weird to go but i believe them mm -hmm. and i was like what do you even mean by that he goes i just believe them. i believe this is the music they want to play yeah. and they love it and they i believe which is an important thing and so i was as believing it and you can make people believe it when you don't and that's the point i was trying to make before was i wasn't confident when i went on stage and got down in my underwear i just knew from the doing it enough it's going to kill, right? In my mind, I'm like it's going the more. So my set, my jokes now develop more confidence because I'm like, by the end of this, you're gonna love I know me. I have it. You're gonna do this yeah. thing, and that's that kind of a thing. And that's almost I think what Patrice was saying. Like once you know, you have to walk on stage believing. Right. You know, I'm not the best looking guy in the room. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I'm definitely, I have to be the funniest guy. I am guy. ugly and stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I have to be the funniest guy in this room. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like just believe that and like. That can carry you if you have that. Like, I also think there's there's a layer to you. You is in your example, but I have my versions of this too. Of like this thing that here's this thing that, uh, but it'll work. It, it's it'll get me somewhere. Which is it also has that layer of here's a guy, whether the audience consciously recognizes it or not, that needs this. Mm -hmm. And there's something very human about seeing somebody do that. You know they're doing it because they're looking for a, approval, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's very human. I think that's why also we're attacked so much is for that reason. Like we are, you know, especially uh, sort of my thing, the things I've been called a, a racist and a Nazi and a homophobe and all these crazy things. Because of the shocking jokes you do? Yeah. It hurts 
like it hurts me, but not because I said that people go, well, some of those jokes hurt other people. Like never with intent. Mm -hmm. I've never written a joke to hurt. I, if I'm making fun of a, a, a group or a race or anything, I'm saying the way I'm saying it in my mind, I'm like, well, yeah, but a, black people should laugh at this black joke I'm making. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm not saying it'd be when they come back at you, uh, like the the people who comb through comedy for this stuff, and they say they go. Uh, you're, there's not. There has to be. I've never looked it up because why I end up on a list somewhere. There's got to be Nazi and white supremacist and homophobic podcasts that exist. And I don't think these people go after them because those people are like, yeah, well, this is what I believe, and right. you're wrong. You know what I mean? Like the white people are the superior thing. I don't feel that, and they know that. So they come at people like me for the joke because they know I'm actually going to get upset and try to be like. Don't call me. You're calling me a Nazi? Like, that's weird. I, I just did a joke. My joke is funny because it's nonsense. I'm saying a ridiculous thing. You're saying I am a Nazi is crazy. That's like a, that's a really detrimental thing. There are people, I had this conversation with the first time, it was the first time I met Mark Norman. It was, I put up a thumbnail, Mark Norman 1.0. I had a conversation with him because I never met him before that. And we were talking about um, different things, but in particular his brand and a lot of the things he does that is shocking mm -hmm. that, and we and I think this way too. Mine is less shocking and more, I guess, annoying. Um, <laughs> but like a lot of people would think, oh, Rick's just trying to be weird or he's trying to be confusing or whatever. And it's like, no, no, I'm trying to get people to laugh. Yeah. But if they don't, then what happens? It's like I have this metaphor where uh, you 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 have, you have a stick and you could break it on. You have to go really hard. And if you go hard and it breaks, and if it breaks, that would be the equivalent of them laughing. It all goes great. Mm -hmm. You have to go hard enough so it breaks because if you don't then you hurt yourself. Yep. And uh, if you don't commit, it's not going to hurt yourself that much, but you know it's not going to break. So you try and break it. When you go really hard because you know you'll break it and it doesn't break, you're going to hurt yourself. But in the comedian's mind, it's a stick. It's a math joke. It, I could be talking about white people or my sister or my wife. or it, It's all the same joke. It's just a different variable. Yep. We know that. Intuitively, we know I'm just saying this thing because that's the structure. But people hear white, black, Jew. They don't hear the the the, no, the, the, the polarization of the why you're doing they're it. They're combing through for bullet point words. I agree that happens. I think on a broader sense, there's more so, there are people who actually probably think that you are these bad things, that I am these bad or annoying things because they don't understand the intention. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, fuck them. I know it's okay. This is the intention. And I've started to, for reasons bigger than comedy, I've started to appreciate how important intention is, but that it's really not the only variable. No. And like, now I have to understand how all of you see the world so I could deliver it a certain way. And that's just overwhelming. No, yeah, it was very, and again, because the people who are affected also, everyone's an individual. So- that's something to navigate sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. if someone, like at this point now, if there's a guy at my show who's in like a forever wheelchair that he has to remote control steer, one, what I always do, my thing, especially with talking to the crowd, is like the rule of thumb, for the most part, is build up the, the weak, kind of nerdy guy and try to take down more like the coolest guy in the room. And both, by the way, with like, I'm not mad at them. I like them. I want them all to enjoy themselves. It's just like. Isn't that pandering I think, too, though? No, no, no. It's just, I think it's organic. I think when it happens, like when I see the thing. But in building them up, still my point is my audience now, if I saw that guy in that wheelchair, I'm happy to be like, you know, what's up? We are asking him, like, does, Dick, does your dick still work mm -hmm. in there? And if he says no, like kind of making some funny of that, and they'll get it. Some other person, you might go, hey, wheels. And they're already like the whole show. They're just like, so, okay, I'm the wheelchair guy. You know what I mean? Like it's how they take it also. Is there a, a difference the now thing. with you having such a big uh, following that people that come and see you know you already. Mm -hmm. So they, they're they into what you do. You don't have to win them over the same way you would maybe when you were starting out. That's why doing spots is still so important. And that's what I'm getting back to now because I've my schedule's been so nuts that I was not doing just – my 15 minute pop-ins, you know, sets at comedy clubs in New York, just schedule wise. It was just daunting to even do it. And now that I have to I said, build new material, 
I'm doing it again. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of good. Like, like, even the new things I have that I was like, uh, man, that thing I'm doing is murdering on the road. And I just thought of it like a week ago. Mm -hmm. And then I go do two in the city. And it's not that they don't work because they're not like, my audience isn't laughing at something that's not funny at all. The ones in the city are your audience? Or you're saying the ones no, in the city are No, I don't announce spots. Audience, right. They're not my audience. And I go up in the city and do those spots. And I'm like, oh, wow, that joke got a little more like, like ooey ooey right. than, than laughs than I did it when I did it on the road. And I'm like, so maybe I do. Because the thing is, I do want to, I don't want to only preach to the choir. My hope is that there's always more people coming in and like liking. So I, I don't just go, okay, I got, this much of an audience now i'm just gonna say whatever and who cares you know like fuck the world and the people who don't get it like i definitely mm -hmm. have like a no no no. come in I, I, whenever i argue with people who you know you're a transphobe you're a homophobe I'm like wait tell me why you think that how do you know that someone's a transphobe or a homophobe well it's when you're on that, stage i it's funny. oh saying that you are yeah, that. that i am yeah oh they, i think you're they, saying they, your audiences i understand no when when somebody reaches out and says like something like that to me and it'll be like the lines and the connections they make are baffling to me because uh you know i remember i remember years ago i had a joke that the, the punch landed it with i go uh in prison i got raped to the song rapper's delight which is like 17 verses mm -hmm. and they're like you think rape's funny like the action of like, like is that a real question that's such a crazy question to ask me do you know what i mean C could we put a magnifying <laughs> glass on that sure uh, and i'm playing devil's advocate to play it because sure. i share your perspective why is it crazy to think that? To think. To you make a joke about getting raped for 17 minutes. Uh huh. Why is it crazy for somebody to think you think rape is funny? Like, could it's you not, appreciate that they, why they would think you think that? I'm happy to have the conversation, but the problem is the open mindedness. I, I do have an open mind. I, I would have argued a zillion times, like, enough uh, trannies. It's a word. I'm not, I don't hate transgendered people. I have no problem. I think they should have. All the rights and what happiness. They? Anyone that who are they? Uh, all the rights and anything they. Just, mm -hmm. It's fine. But I go and my argument was I go. I, I say the word trans. It's just the word I'm picking for it that seems to be out there and it's not a problem. And I go. It just was enough people. I have a joke about the word nothing. It's a big deal. But I I, I still hold, uphold. I don't know why it's a big deal if I say tranny. If I'm saying tranny or trans, I'm just identifying the tranny is is a derogatory term more so like and it was saying jew I, instead of jewish enough trans people just said to me or uh, not arguing not arguing they go oh well the thing is why you're going to get some flack from that is it's just been so associated with like pornography pro, you know tranny prostitute uh tranny porn star you know tranny porn star of the year and, and it's, it's always well, associated with level. like the most uh like kind of like darkest like corners of the trans world so in my mind i go so if i say trans like in life like that that takes away you feeling that, that i feel that way and like sure i'll just say trans right and i even say i go on stage if the word tranny phonetically is, is the is the hardest hit you know what i mean it's the like best if you're thing. rhyming the, with granny it's gonna get the punch i even say that when i say that on stage i go rhymes with a lot it's got that nny at the end is great mm -hmm. and uh but I go in life, I, I don't challenge it. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't argue with a trans person. Why can't I say it? I go, I don't know, well, you're a trans person, so you're saying it It bothers a lot of trans people. I heard it enough times that I was like, sure, I'll just say trans. It's, I, I didn't mean harm either way. So that's a, it's a weird thing. That, so I don't, I don't just like stand on my ground and be like, there's, I, I don't want to hear the thing. I do hear the counter arguments to some of those things. You know what I mean? But I mean, to make the generalization to go back to what we were saying, I see that joke. You think rape is funny? It's like I think that is a dumb question because no, I feel like I had to really frame that and do what it is I'm paid to do, and people like trusted me to go like, how can I frame that to make it? Do you know what I mean? Like, could you have, tell me why it's funny? Why the jokes get raped? Uh, because uh, the song is so long. Like, <laughs> if getting raped, the duration of a song. First of all, I turn it to myself. It's me that's uh -huh. happening to. Um, it's clearly not true. And, and if you were to pick a song of something bad happening to you, whether it's rape or having a stomach ache mm -hmm. or uh, ha having to be in a cryo chamber for a while, you would want the shortest thing. Yeah, so, I had the so worst this joke thing, is the biggest thing you're afraid of in jail happened to me and for the longest time imaginable because they were doing it to a song. You know what I mean? That's, so that's where I think comedians and some people see the math of that. And, uh, and a lot of people outside of that, without that kind of palate, don't see... You're saying 
horrible thing. What song do you want? Uh, give me uh, Rapper's Delight. No, no, no. You should pick like a, a jingle. You're yeah, picking yeah. the wrong thing. It's, not, it's, yeah. it's about the choice to have that. Mm -hmm. But people just, yeah, it's just. It's a very bizarre thing. You know, I say this all the time. Like, I don't have a large, I've got plenty of female fans, but like. Nice. The, uh, I say the majority when you go to my shows, it's like a lot of women there, but I, it's mostly the guys who are the fans. And I would say their wives who they had to have this conversation uh -huh. with. No, no, he's nice. No, you'll see he's nice after he's going to come up. Because I am nice. I'm excited yeah. to meet every. I'm excited to meet everybody, and I, 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 uh, I don't know. I don't draw any lines like that. So it is so weird that people do come in with like a preconceived. You notion. said even agents. The beginning of this conversation said agents are a little uh, um, hesitant to forward the request to their clients. To come to Skankfest. Right? Um, it's almost like you, you. I don't want to say chosen, but in a way uh, accepted that you had that uphill battle in these certain things based on content, which is just your point of view. But the battle was brought to us, and I think it is. You're right, it is, but it's so like, anytime they write these articles, we're like, guys, we don't want this smoke, really. We tell really don't. What, I don't know about any of these articles, so can um, you tell me? Just like, I, mean, I don't want to give me too much hype, but just articles that are saying the most terrible thing, you know, it's the person who writes a op-ed thing. Mean things about you and your group of, sure. based on the subject matter you're talking about? Well, it, that, Yes, and they said, but like real jumps, exactly. Like these white supremacists, right. and you're like, you know, Nazis. Crap, I'm Jewish. Do you, know you what I mean? Like, yeah, it was funny. On oh, the, let me get you another water. On the, uh, oh, do okay. you want something to eat? <laughs> oh, you're. Oh, can I, you, can I get you something? Um, my, I didn't even overthink. So when one of these guys, an article came out, and specifically they were calling me a uh, homophobe, not homophobe, uh, a Nazi. I thought it'd be funny for the radio show. My mom's Jewish, obviously my grandmother. And my grandmother was staying with my mom at the time too, before she passed. And uh, I'm glad we got this because I have drops of her voice on our radio show mm -hmm. forever, which is the sweetest thing. But I was like, oh, you know, funny mom. I go, you and my mom call the show, because this article came out yesterday, I go, and just yell into the ether at this guy. You know what I mean? Tell him, like, you don't call, you're calling my baby a Nazi. And I, yeah. I thought that'd be funny to have my mom yell at him. Him being the person that wrote the article. You're right, not but really just into the ether. Right, no, right. he's not there. Just like, yeah. And uh, it, we ended up keep getting it funny and making it funny. But I realized very quickly when my grandmother got on the phone that I was like, oh, she's mad. Mm. Like, it really hurts her that her son's. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hit me like that. I'm just, I'm more like. She's mad that people think that about you. Right. Right. I, where I'm, she's like, they don't know you and you're the sweetest thing, mm -hmm. you know. And of course, my grandmother doesn't know all of my dirty or whatever, but she is right in the sense that nothing that she doesn't know about me would make her be like, how could you? It's right. just things a grandmother wouldn't want to hear. Or would you say a granny? <laughs> grands, grands, <laughs> grands, grands. She, grands. She, um, she caught up like pretty pissed off. And I, and I really, I also hate boo-hooing over the hate because that's kind of their thing to do too, but their thing like makes waves. Like I don't mind an opinion of like, of course I'm not for everybody. You know what I mean? I get it. Um, I don't know if I'd be my favorite comedian if I didn't do comedy. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if that's the <laughs> genre I'd be drawn to, right? Who knows? Well, I would have to be. You'd think, maybe, but well, it, it probably is because I always said the, to me the I loved all stand-up comedy, all of it. From I'll the so proppiest stuff. and to the to the most like heady, uh, thoughtful stuff, semantics. But prop, and I understand you were just trying to find uh, two ends of a of a of, of the spectrum. But proppy, um, which by the way, just as somebody who used props, let me say mm -hmm. proppy is a little derogatory, <laughs> uh, and I mean that uh, props uh, and heady are not mutually exclusive. They're not not I mean, I use props in a very specific, layered way where on surface it may seem a little bit silly, but it serves such a purpose and it's really great commentary. For sure. So I just want to make sure that people understand that just because somebody uses props doesn't mean that they're not heady. I mean, for fuck's sake, you know, I mean, you think you get it bad when people are calling you a Nazi. I have people saying that I'm just some fucking prop comic Jew bitch. And it's like... <laughs> You don't get it, man. I must ask you something. Have you ever considered the fact that this is on purpose, man? Society's not ready. But if society is not ready, is it their fault? Yeah. Is it? 
It is. Okay. If society isn't ready for chat GBT, is it society's fault that they're not ready or is it the person who created the product's fault for making something too soon? Hmm. It's the people. When will they Fear be ready? Change. But that, but that's not about being ready. That's about them not having the change yet. Most people will say you're never ready to have a kid, but mm -hmm. you have it. Sure. If you wait until you're ready, you might be a redneck or however that goes. But you, you're not going to be ready until the thing has to happen to incite that being ready thing. That's sure. why I mean, a lot of people say I have completely changed, at least podcasting for the better, but comedy and you know, but but and then other people are doing it. It's like. Is it going to be hard for, because I'm like this pioneer, this heady, propsy <laughs> pioneer? I don't know. Proppy. It's, um, we know it is, you say that it is true. And I've, one of the biggest, when I first started coming out here and like working a little more and like meeting people and doing shows and hopping on some things and some con concept shows that aren't just straight stand up, there's a lot of different like things. Like storytelling that, or shows or, about or, like or Kill Tony and, and things right. like that. And when I'd go back to New York, I would say in a lot of things, I go, it's New York has that vibe too much. And that's what I think. You don't want to get like that, uh, what do you call it? That feeling where it's like, we're, when you start like, it's like, we're the street prophets, man. We're saying the thing that's annoying too, where it's like putting too much importance. Mm -hmm. The importance of comedy, I think, and I see it when I meet fans too. It's you're getting, Howard Stern always put this the same way too. You're getting people just through their shittiest time. Uh, their commute to and from work. You're making them laugh. Like with Brock, you know what I mean? You're entertaining like the, That's one, that's definitely one of them. I don't think it's as dark as that. I mean, I'm in a great mood and I want to watch something to keep me there. Sure. No, no, but I'm saying, but you do just get them through. That's why they, I think the reason they get very connected to like broadcasting comedy and stuff and, and podcasts and everything is they're getting no, you're making them laugh on a yeah. time where they'd just be normally just sitting there waiting to get home. A distraction, or, at least, in those moments. Uh, 18 wheeler drivers, you know, cross country drivers, warehouse workers, all this stuff. Now, it's not that those are the only people that consume comedy, but those people, uh, like, get, and, they because, listen and, while because, and because they give so much, like, you don't even know, like, it's, it's gotten me through. Like, my, yeah. I've had to drive my dad to dialysis every day for the past six months. And like it's just miserable. He's dying, basically. And like, I, but but you guys make me laugh, man. That means something. That's the importance of it. I don't know what we're saying is like take it or leave it. It's just some idiot's opinion, really. And what L.A. had more in their thing, which I think is what the eye roll was in New York. But I don't think it should be an eye roll. Is the will? I go. New York has lost a little bit of the will to be silly. Where is the silly? The when they did roast masters which is basically the roast battle in New York. Mm -hmm. And when they were doing that, they I think they may, maybe tried it once, but they didn't. New Yorkers didn't, like the Negro wave, which is the thing they have at the roast battle, where it was Jeremiah and Jamar and Willie Turner, and they would go- Hunter. Uh, Willie Hunter, yeah. They would, uh, they would have the, uh, you know- Cut to a clip. The mission of the wave is to make the audience go, what am I witnessing with my two eyes? That's the wave right there for you. Get ready for us, we're coming for you. To make this show the greatest on the goddamn planet. Just camera out of my fucking face. <laughs> they'd have the, um, you know, somebody would say the roast thing, and if there was something, they'd run up there with the props energy. and dress a certain way and, and do these crazy, yeah. just silly things. Kill Tony had the band that would be a different theme every yeah. week, and they would commit to the characters. And I think that's great. I think it's like, it should be all. It can't be everybody, you know, when everyone came out at Hannah Gatsby, her comedy's not for me, so I wasn't even judging. Like, who cares? That's not my thing. What I thought was awful was when she, <clears throat> when she did an article. About Chappelle? And wrote, maybe, it may have been Chappelle. I just remember the quote of her saying, if you're just doing comedy to make people laugh, then get out of the way, you're wasting people's time. If you're not trying to make a difference. And I just thought of the people she cuts out there. He goes, are you saying Carrot Top shouldn't be doing comedy? Should Brian Regan not be doing, should David Tell not? They're not personal. They're not talking about right. changing the world or worldviews or things. Like, they're just going up there and saying the goofiest, silliest thing. Of course they should be doing it. They're three of the best people doing it. Um, I had a conversation with Sam Morrell. Um, I would love to find the clip if so. I think it was his second time on. Um, it's interesting. That's what in the Letterman interview at one point he goes like, 
stand up is art. And I said, no, it's not. We ask audience members if they were pooping during, like, there's no art that, we're not artists. That's a very funny response, and I don't want to get you. I do have a, I, I, I disagree. Really? Yeah. Whoa, so, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to remind you, boners, okay? <laughs> Subscribe to my show, dude. All right, go back to the show. Go back. He was talking about what he's doing, and he said something about, like, you know, art, or I don't know, I don't think really I'm an artist, but... And there was a, I don't know if it was an insecurity or a, 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 yeah, it seemed like an insecurity that he didn't at least want to publicly define. If not, he didn't believe what he does does as art. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, I, I disagreed with him on the thing. And it's absolutely art. Now, I'm not saying, I think he's fantastic, but okay. just the craft in general, I'm saying somebody doing what we do doesn't mean it's good art or bad art or important art, but by definition, it's sure, yeah. it's expression and people will feel different things and we can't control what they feel. And some people just like a painting might feel oddly connected and not know why. Some people might not like something that most people do like. But it is art. Um, and what your intention for what this art is supposed to be is your own personal thing. And yes. it doesn't even have to be defined. It could just be to make people laugh. It could be to change the world and anywhere in between or any make outliers. Make them think, give you things. Yeah. But I'm like... Um, but... To say that there is only one one form, one purpose to the art is, I, I do think that there is purpose to that, of, of to changing things and to offering new perspectives. But yeah, I don't agree that that's, that's the only thing. But before I'd want somebody to be like, you know, in a sycophantic way, like. What does that mean again? Say, afraid of people? Say the word in a sycophantic would be like just a, a, a fan that was like, tell me to lay on a train track, so I will. What's <laughs> like, the definition of sycophantic? Oh, doing something to win somebody's... No, just like com you're, you're completely wrapped into them. Like, whatever you say, I'll do next. Doing something. So they'll do anything to, to get you to like them. To go like, oh, yeah these, guys, yeah, these guys will do this. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't... I, I never do this, nor do I want to do this. Is that we, we, and we know it's, it's kind of a weird responsibility to have. I, anybody, who came, anybody who came or comes at, like, me or the podcast or whatever like that, I could tweet out i'll be like yo wreck this person's day to the fans and they'll do whatever and there's people who are sitting at home and have the time and ability to do something to their probably their their uh accounts you know they're like uh social accounts and whatever thing or just hit them and blast them with a bunch of negative stuff or whatever it would be they would just do it i wouldn't want to uh send people on that thing because i don't want people to oh, like no it's like i just want you to just like just enjoy my thing consume what i put out and enjoy it and that's it i don't, I don't need you or to don't like, enjoy it yeah or yes but i don't need you to, exactly i don't need you to tell the world i'm a piece of shit and i also don't want you to die for me <laughs> you know like just except when someone comes up and they're so like oh that, even fans that are shit you know they don't, you're in this you know bum fuck town and they never thought you were gonna come there and you meet there and grown men when they're like yeah, and it's, it's sweet I, I'm, I'm not shitting on it i think it's very very sweet but i i have to have that weird moment where i feel their hands shaking on my back while we're taking a picture and Boy, what does like, that have to do with people uh, hating people i'm saying more that i want people to like want to meet me and smoke a joint and have a cigarette or uh you know have a beer mm -hmm. and smoke a joint and i don't want them to be like there's no reason to worship me <laughs> do you know what i mean there's no, nothing i'm saying people do i'm saying there are people out there though that are so invested in a thing that they get like that, you know what I mean? They get a little like uh, starstruck. Yeah, and, and starstruck's fine. I still get starstruck. It's more just like why well, I'm just a guy. I don't, man. Yeah, I exactly. I'm, I like, I'm like, no, no, no. Just enjoy that. Like, yeah, me and you are gonna bullshit now with a bunch of people and talk for an hour in a circle and smoke a joint after a show, and it's like, yeah, and then listen to the radio show and laugh at our silly stuff. How do you calm people down when they, they seem excited? I remember I was uh, at the movies with you know Lamorne Morris. Mm -mm. Um, uh, this is actually him. Um, nice. uh, Lamorne is uh, he was a he's new cursed girl. and put in that thing. <laughs> is it cursed and put into it? Did yeah, he, say? he was cursed and put. No, in it was modeled after him. I don't want to. I don't want to say that there's any curse on Lamorne when he's just. This is just him. It's this one, right here. Oh, and uh, that's what I pictured when you said his name. Yeah, uh, he's uh, uh, in New Girl, and that had a lot of fans. Sure. And I remember we were uh, uh, leaving a movie theater, and we were going down an escalator, and somebody was coming up, and he saw them like they were about to come up but they didn't come up because they were waiting for him to come down and saw him like looking that's him and, and uh they were too scared to say something and 
he said, hey, do you uh, do you want a picture or something? He knew that they wanted to. Mm -hmm. But there's something about that. Like he, you have to be 100 percent sure, because if they didn't want a picture and you're like, do you want a picture now that it's like, yeah, let's take a picture. You know, it's just weird. Oh, so there's a art to it and there's a confidence and there's a there's a reading a room to it. Um, that is impressive for people who are experienced for being recognized. It also shortens the thing where you don't have to have these long things. Oh, I've had to watch, I mean, between Kevin Hart, uh, Sal from Practical Jokers is a guy, like you have to plot your walking route because like it oh, will. Oh, Sal recognized that much? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, he's like. I just had him, I, we just met, he did when I was in New Jersey. Oh, uh, hell yeah. No, uh, he's awesome. We went to, I mean, we a month went. ago. During quarantine, we went away to a cabin for uh, like a week or so. I mean, in the middle of nowhere of the mountains of somewhere in a little IGA grocery store that's surrounded by woods, ultimately. And in there, wearing a mask, hood up, sunglasses wow. on. Problematic that recognition. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's flattering, but that sucks. It's very flat. Well, what also sucks about it is people's that level of fame where he's not able to be very. Let's see, the thing about my audience, too because of how much I tour and radio and call-ins and social media, I'm very, and I don't have a millions and millions of people audience like the Impractical Jokers have. Mm -hmm. I am able to kind of like, they know me on a, on a little more of a level. They they feel like ownership over someone like Sal. When they're a fan of a celebrity, they feel like this ownership over them where I've seen it go uh, he has to deal with this a lot. And Sal's the sweetest guy in the yeah. world. But it, it's like, hey, like I can't stop here. I see these people are going to stop me. I can't because we have to keep moving. We have to get to the show. Right. And when he goes, yo, Sal, oh, hey, shit, it's Sal. Hey, guys, thank you so much, man. I, 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 would you take a picture of Sal? He goes, I'm sorry, guys. I, just, I have to get this other thing, man. But I appreciate, man. Thank you guys so much. But then he gets down the street. All right, man. That's cool. I mean, I watch your fucking show. Yeah. But And it's like. They now, and I get anxiety about that because I'm yeah. like that. If I have to be short with anybody, I'm yeah. like, oh, they're being dicks. That's why my problem with, I've tried to get better at navigating the meeting people after a show because I do it casual. I don't like to do like an organized meet and greet. And you go out there and see, it's like the calming people down. It's like, no, guys, guys, let's just like, sit here and have a thing. But also if someone's like, but you don't, I, I, if I, I don't want called, to, then if, I don't want if to. If I am being pulled where they go, dude, you, you, we need you inside. You have to go on for a second. And someone said, he goes, well, dude, like, can we just like, like take, like, just take a picture with me and then with him, with him. And, and they're going, Jay, we need you inside. I'm the anxiety. I'm like, if I go, guys, I'm sorry. I just really can't take a picture right now. I'm like, that person goes, what a showbiz dick. Yeah. That's I, operational I, cost though. I hate that. It yeah. has to happen. Can <laughs> yeah. I read you a message I got sure. recently? Um, so I, uh, I'm more known as a as an award winning dramatic actor, and that's not a blanket statement. I'm just saying I happen to have won one, but it, uh, yeah, it precedes you. Um, but uh, there was um, I'm I'm uh, trying to find because I'm I'm starting to save. Here it is. Okay, so um, even though I'm not going to say this person's name, I don't even well, I don't know. If, whatever. Uh, there's somebody that I met years ago. Saw me at a comedy club, asked me to do their show. It was a, a show at a, a place that was like traveling. Mm -hmm. So you end up spending a couple of days with this person, kind of picked you up from the airport. You got to know him a little bit, kind of, I don't know, four or five years ago. Um, I know f 30 faces sure. at any <laughs> given time. So I don't remember anybody. And uh, especially if I met you uh, a couple of times, kind of years and years and years and years ago. So I did a spot at the improv and I'm, I'm getting off stage and it was uh, the, the late show and it's almost midnight and I wasn't going to not do the show, but it's one of those shows. I don't want to do it and I go home right after. Yeah. So I'm leaving and he goes, hey, man, with an energy of he. You good. Yeah. So he goes, hey, man, with an energy of he knows me. So I'm like, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm it's very easy to not have to pretend. I'm like, I'm sorry. Remind me. He tells, oh, so I'm, the dead. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. And I did remember. <laughs> I'm even bad at that. Remind me. I always feel when I do that, they're already like, what a dick. But, yeah, but, but then that's the equivalent of like when you're doing a joke and you feel like a liar and now you're not present in life. Like, just tell I'm sorry. You got to tell me. And if that bothers you, let's figure this out now because I'm not going right. to remember no, you. No, you're right. I'm wrong about that. But it is. I am guilty. 
probably the law of lies that you tell in life. The biggest one I tell with consistency is, uh, <clears throat> do you remember right. uh, two times ago that you were here, my chick was up front and she said the thing and I just go, okay, okay. Can I, and I, and can I, I give don't you advice? mean that at all. Can I give you some advice? Yes. Um, uh, you do that because it matters to you. You do that because you don't want to hurt their feelings and or you don't want to seem that you feel you're more important or whatever the negative thing yeah. that you're projecting they will put on you and they very well may is out of your control because the truth is you don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> so whatever way you need to do it that shows acceptance in it as opposed to I don't fucking know but just for example I mean my Jewish version I'm sorry I don't remember I uh, please tell me I'm interested I just don't I don't remember I don't remember things. Yeah. And if they get upset, so, but just like, it just, it makes everything so much easier than to not have to worry about it. That was the old uh, Norm MacDonald, I think it was his half hour special a zillion years ago. He's making, because it hit me, because I was in school, I was still like a school kid when that came out. And I remember, because I did stuff like this so much. He goes, you ever lie for no reason there? You know, just like no reason. Someone go, because it was very specifically this. So someone's like, uh, hey, did you ever see this movie? And I didn't. And you just go, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, I've done that. And then you even get like the, what was your favorite part? Uh, there was all thing was good. Why did you have a favorite? What was your favorite part? Yeah. Oh yeah, I guess that was a pretty good. And then you almost go. And now you're hot. I'm becoming a, no, but I'm almost like the upset. I'm becoming a master manipulative liar. Because I know that I know that the three directions to get us there. I don't think that's a good quality. <laughs> also, you're not a master manipulator at it. We know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Unless yeah. you're so unaware and you're just, you're unless that person's doing it too. Yeah, yeah. Just to try to get just, through the small talk. Just wanting up you know. each other. I mean, so I'll meet with some people that like in this business, like representation I've had or whatever, and they talk about a thing. And I used to, I used to be honest with everything. And I would say, I could tell you didn't read it and that's okay. And they, no, no, no. And then you would kind of call it up. But now I'm just like, this is the way this person communicates through their own needs they have. And it is what it is. Excuse me, I remember my buddy, uh, uh, one of my best friends from home, shout out to Jeff Karp, um, uh, put up a video of him getting dunked on by LeBron. Jeffy. He's a good basketball player. And when we were younger, there was some kid, I don't know what this situation was, a sister's friend or someone babysitting, I don't know. Uh, and he goes, do you play baseball? And he goes, yeah, yeah. And then immediately he's like, what? Because he doesn't. <laughs> and then immediately just goes, I don't know why I said that. I don't. <laughs> and just getting out right away. Just stop fucking lying. Yeah. Um, nah, actually, I don't. Yeah. That's yeah. Great. I don't know why I said that. But otherwise it builds. And then. Uh, but so anyway, so this guy, it was fine. Oh, yeah, I remember. And he's telling us stuff. By the way, the, the, the context of this is less about remembering people and more about um, people having ownership over you and or people drink. I hate I. I. I I don't drink. I'm not sober. I'll have a drink every now and then. But mm -hmm. being around people who drink and drunk, it's uh, I, it's not for me. I can't stand it. Even people I love, I cannot fucking stand it. I can't stand hearing the stories over and over. It's amazing how bad people are at it for people that do it a lot. The people that do it a lot are the worst at it. Like, I, that's why I feel like no one's at, like, my girlfriend's not been drinking for years now. And she had to quit drinking, mm -hmm. actually, at the same time. But I'm blown away by her. I'm like... I can't be the first person who tells you like when you're obliterated, you're like a problem. And like, Wait, they, say that differently. I don't know what you mean. Like I would be surprised like she would get that level of drunk still at times because I'm like, have you not had your whole life of right. drinking of right, people right. telling you like, yo, you kind of got us kicked out of that place yesterday and you did this and you're being like loud and like uh, erratic and annoying. Like no one says anything. And if you, th if you think you lack like, awareness. You think you're awesome when you're drunk because who's told you that? Like yeah, everyone you, around you always seems like, uh, here she goes yeah. again and you're doing it every night like this is how they want me like they want the party girl out yeah it's rough it's a it's a disease and it's rough and 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 uh uh everyone has their challenges but i it's not my bag to carry especially if you're just some guy i don't know you know no the extra that's why i said i'm really good at like let's not go to the extra place like if people are gonna uh -huh. get drunk at the comedy club and be that and i'm not there at all and not that kind of drunk yeah and just you know i'm stoned or whatever and again there are talk loud and a lot of touch talking which i hate um you know i do i i i, I, I don't go to the second place you, oh there's another we go to another bar everyone goes over here and you're like i 
like you're gonna tell me that's like you said you're gonna tell me that story again yeah you're gonna tell me a story again about the first time you met me or whatever. like uh -huh. let's just not you said your girlfriend stops stopped drinking at the same time did you mean as you do you not drink no no no. i mean uh she just stopped drinking no i don't i don't know if i said the same time i mean cut back actually the same time but maybe spoke wrong um, um so so but uh no my problem my addictions are uh was all my life that i have to keeping any kind of check or stop ever is like food stuff and cigarettes yeah um besides that there's I nothing to soda about food addiction yeah i besides that i don't have any soda hasn't drank for a long time mm -hmm. now and he's another one he and it's funny because my girlfriend's a producer on the radio show that me and soda do so it's like we had that conversation a lot where i'm like it's so funny how much i i believe you both i believe you completely believe but them about what but i can't uh, sympathize with or empathize with is the I'm like hey you know like you were pretty awesomely fun uh, with a couple of drinks I'm talking about my girlfriend more than Soder uh -huh. Soder I never saw like problematically drunk it was more like he wasn't a problem when he was drunk so he drank a lot you know what I mean he wasn't a problem so it was probably hurting his body more Um, I don't understand that it's like you know three shots and a beer for my girlfriend i'm like you're so fun it was nice to see her get a little loose which yeah. is nice to see her like you know she's busy very responsible person it's nice to see her kind of cut loose but if she knows that's what does it and you even before she drinks go hey how about though you just have these two drinks and then you're buzzed and you're feeling good she will you said three shots in a beer though so in that before drinks sure yeah yeah but, uh, but you know what i'm saying like that's let's say that's a recipe that gets her there a person who's got that gene in them or whatever the, the disease or whatever you can yeah. call it is like she will that will be the time that she will sneak off and quietly have them give her another drink do you know what yeah. i mean like she just can't I, I can tell you how to empathize with it you ever you ever cigarettes it's cigarettes is how i do it i go i can't smoke a cigarette a day right. i have to i couldn't just go i smoke socially once on the weekends once in a while like now it's either i smoke or i have to not touch another cigarette I would try and portion things out. Um, I used to have uh, cakes in my fridge all the time, like full sheet cakes, because mm -hmm. you always have a cake. And I would you put a piece of cake on the plate instead of bringing the whole tray over, which I would do, because you could stop yourself. But if it's there, you'll eat it. So you just put a slice on the plate, and then you're fine. But still, like you have it, you eat it. Yeah. You know, I, you you just want it. But the yeah, thing but, is, but it's up to me. Not ordering the next one is as simple as not going back to the fridge. Well, like, yeah, not, I've learned that if it's in the house, I'll eat it. So okay, I have so to you not have it in the, the cakes all together. Gotcha. Yeah, I think I, I was going to say. I thought you were saying that. goes, and I figured it out. <laughs> Just keep the cake in the fridge. No, I did, I'm saying that's not enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying if it's there, you know, if there's no, if the, if the bar shuts down, she's not going to have another drink. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So this guy is now talking uh, at me. Uh, and I use those words specifically. He's talking at me. And he is a little touchy. And I do a decent job of being like, I, I just literally like, no, no, too close. Um, he goes to someone I really want you to meet. And then he introduces me to somebody who he just met, who he's in town to do business with. <laughs> and and he's talking to me. And he's also, it's fine that I, I'm not offended, but I don't think he realizes what he said wasn't the nicest. He goes, because I was trying something on this set where it was a little stranger. Mm -hmm. And he goes, how come you weren't doing the, the other stuff? The other stuff was so much funnier. The stuff I was doing five <laughs> years ago. And I go, uh, you know, like, what am I going to say? Fuck off. So I just go, <laughs> yeah, I, you know. Yeah. And then he, when he says something, he spits on me enough to where... Like, it's not, Ugh. you know, it's just a little wet. It wasn't like he spit at me. Yeah. I go like this. He goes, oh, sorry, sorry. Like, he's, and he, what, are you wiping it off my face? <laughs> Get away from me, man. And so I'm just turned off. Now, I'm not, I don't think this person is a bad person. I think this is not the day for me to be talking to him. Yeah, it's just not work. This is not going well. I want to leave. You want, you're like, let me get you a drink. You want to chat. I'm not in the mood. You're spitting, you're touching, you're insulting. So I'm like, listen, man, I'm, I'm very tired. Um, it, and I saw, and he kept going. I'm on a TV show at the moment and he kept talking about my success, not in a way to where he's like, Hey man, I love this thing or congratulations on this thing in a way where it's like, Ooh, Mr. S Mr. Successful now, you know, yeah. I don't know if there was a judgment in it, but it definitely didn't make me feel good. Sure. It's like, what do you, what do we want me to say? You just, and he kept just someone calling you a big shot. Oh, big shot. Yeah. I don't think I'm a big shot. You know, since I last saw you, I have a lot of stuff. It's good for you. Congratulations. Good job. Good job. I don't think it was malintent. I just, it just, I didn't want it. 
Yeah. I remember I saw Burr on a uh, on a podcast where um, it was Ethan Klein. Uh, I don't watch that podcast much. I don't know much, but I had Burr on recently and I was really nervous. So I was worried like, great episode. I'm glad, blah, 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 blah. But, but I heard like, oh, other people get nervous with Bill. There's the Bill Burr effect. So I watched some of them after. And I didn't think it was that big of a deal. But there was a, it, 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 it was a recurring thing where he kept saying, the great Bill Burr. And he kept saying it. And Bill's like, stop. Just say you're grateful that I'm here. Uh, I didn't think it was that big of a deal, but it made no. me think of that. Sure. So I'm out with this guy, right? For reasons that he might understand if he wasn't drinking so much. Um, I'm out before I saw him. I want to go home. Success, success, meet the guy. Oh, blah, blah. And he keeps talking. And he's like, and here's this guy. And like, I don't, you don't even know him. Why am I, what are we doing? And he kept saying, thank you so much for coming. As if like he booked the show at the improv. Why? You, thank you. It means a lot that you came. And I'm like, do you think I came for you? I didn't know you were here. Later, I realized he was talking about for coming to do his show five years ago, but he didn't say that. He goes, this was so fun seeing you. Thanks for coming. You yeah, have to so, say thanks for coming five years ago, which yeah, you already think. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> no ellipses when you're drunk. <laughs> So now um, I leave and I'm outside and there's a guy outside selling pies. Now I'm not going to buy one of his pies because I don't know this guy and it's midnight. <laughs> street pies. It's a street pie. They look good and I was genuinely interested. But to not waste his time, I said, hey man, I just want you to know I have my own things. I'm not going to eat one of your pies. They look amazing. But I'm curious, what is this? What's going on? And he answered me. It was great. And he was wearing a suit and he looked great. The pie, they look, they really, they look great. And I was so interested. What is this bit? And he has a brick and mortar store. I'm like, is this your hustle? Like, are you bringing people in? So now they're going to go to your store. How often do you do? Like, I'm so curious sure. what this game is. So even though I wanted to leave, I'm, ta I'm talking to the pie guy now. Now this drunk guy goes outside and sees me talking to pie guy. By the way, I had the timing. I had just left pie guy. I, this was 3.14154. <laughs> I was almost gone. And he. He starts talking to me again. And the I drunk guy, I, drunk guy. And I go, oh. You're so successful. Da, 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 da. I'm just, and I said, so, and then he's like, he's on a on, loop. let me get you a drink. I already said four times. So I just did what I knew I needed to do, which I needed to plant a firm boundary. I didn't let him finish his sentence. In the same way, you ever get, uh, you're calling customer service and you're on hold for a long time. Someone finally picks up. You explain the whole thing and they go, well, let me transfer you to somebody. And you're like, oh, all right. Yeah, go ahead. But they don't just say, let me transfer you. So I'm going to transfer you. So when I do that, just please know that I'm going to put you on hold. And I just want to say thank you so much. for. And it's another 15 seconds. And what I'll do is I go, I, it's, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Could you just transfer me now? Because I, I don't want to. I don't want that. But that's a big thing to overcome. I think Soder does have that too. One of the things I appreciate about him so much is his willingness to have the awkward conversation or say the thing. I'm just not that. I'll sit there. And, and my excuse is always going to be, well, I don't want to make them uncomfortable. And I'll talk about it later. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? On a thing. But I was, I was, Miami was one of those, like these drunk guys. They run this website that's got a, or a, or a page that has a lot of views on it. So they give them the, the club lets them kind of run whatever, you know, they come in with their Miami suits on and they drink for free, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And just whatever. And they, they shout the club out and that's what it's worth for them. And this guy just followed me around for an hour after the show and all the things, just not my things. He wants me to go to this, the nightclub where they got bottle service and it's yeah. on him and they know how to get into this and we'll go to this club on the marina and oh, the girls, I'm wearing shorts, by the way. <laughs> I'm dressed like I dress for a show, you know, I'm wearing jean shorts and a sweatshirt. He's like, doesn't matter that you're with us. And that's that constant, like the Touching. chest, the yeah. chest, oh. the chest, every time. And I just, but I will... I'll eat it for 45 minutes. Soder told me he doesn't speak up for himself. So it's interesting that you think he does. I want you guys to have that conversation. I will. I will and I'm pissed at him now for that. I, I didn't realize how much I uh, doormat myself in order to make other people feel comfortable. I didn't realize how much I'm like willing to put up with bullshit in order to like not uh, put people out or bum people out, I guess. No, I've seen him. He was, he, he'll have the conversation. Like every time we even have to tell like, Hey, can you tell so and so we're not gonna like? I don't know how to tell them like we can't have them on the show or something. They're like, I'll call them. You know, just like do it. I for somebody really who doesn't like feeling like they're lying, mm -hmm. you sh don't have a problem doing that if if it's if it's to avoid discomfort. Yeah, yeah. Which is why people that. usually lie yeah. though. The people usually lie to avoid discomfort. I try to avoid it. Yeah. So on stage, 
and off stage, those are almost inverted. Yep. Absolutely. That's why I said it's all, it's why I love Impractical Joker so much, the show, and uh, why I was such a fan before I even got to know Sal is because it's uh, unjudgeable funny for me because I wouldn't do it. Right. There's no way. I really like, maybe some other people are just like, don't think the Joker's is a good show because they go, why? Because you asked a couple like uh, why the, a mother and son would be out. It's an extreme sport of comedy. And I'm like, I, and I go, if I see the joke, like I can call someone who's clearly someone's wife. I go, oh, dude, you brought your mom out. And then when he goes, and she goes, like, mom, I go, I can make that quickly. Like, no, I know, I'm kidding. Like, right. you clearly is thing. But to sit, but to have to kid the thing goes. So you brought your uh, your mother out to see a movie today, and then just kind of like casually do. I'm like, no, man, I feel terrible. Yeah. I'm like, I, I would just so quickly be like, so you brought your mom, and the guy, if the guy gets like excuse me i'm like no no no. we're doing a tv show though I'd, I'd ruin it the difference is you would be doing that for the bit and you don't want to versus doing it for your own boundaries yeah and the latter is a very important thing to be able to do yeah and people pleasing i find it to be a very selfish act you're just you're you're that's you're the avoiding real manipulation. you're avoiding something it's, you're not making them feel better you're avoiding being involved you're in also something. calibrating that potential relationship wrong and you're not developing the instincts to make yourself feel safe and good even though I don't want to talk to this guy ever again, ever again, I don't want him walking away being like that guy's in it. Like that thinking. What I'm happens an if he walks away and thinks that? I don't know. I'm just like they're out there in the world. And but aren't like, they already? You're talking about the articles. Absolutely. But now I've put a face on it, and in my mind, I'm like, I guess the guy was just trying to like you know, chest tap me into going to a club with him because that's he where me I don't think I was intention, funny. That's where intentions are in everything. That's what I those are the uh, the realizations I've had where well my intentions are good but when I see other people's intentions are good and it still bothers me I go intentions are important but they're not everything and oftentimes they lack a lot of awareness. Oh yeah. And to be able to if I'm touching somebody and I think we're having a good time and I used to I talk about on stage now how I didn't have any friends growing up but I didn't know that because nobody Nobody was mean to me. Nobody bullied me. I just thought everybody was busy. And I just I just always wanted to wrestle and play. And I, I, and of course they wanted to wrestle because that's what I wanted to do. Sure. Because nobody said I don't want to wrestle. They just said I can't come over. <laughs> so I want somebody to say, hey, I don't know if you know this, but you're touching my chest a lot and I'm not liking it. I would then be like, I'm so glad you told me and I'm going to stop. So telling other people, it's also easy for me because I know I would... You know, uh, valuing, I've said this on my podcast before, but I value information so much that it supersedes the ego a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. And it's not that I'm enlightened. It's just, I was on a date with a girl once um, and we were in a Target. So I guess I'll call it a date. We liked each other and we went to a Target. Sure. And I was doing bits and I was hysterical and everybody loves me. <laughs> and, but I found out maybe that's not the case when she goes, shh. And immediately I went, oh, am I being loud? Thank you. And she goes, yeah, it's a little loud. And I'm like, I didn't think I was. It doesn't mean I wasn't. I know for sure she thought I was. Yeah. So maybe other people thought I was. But my thought was, oh, yeah, thanks for telling me. I'm going to keep doing my bits, but I'll do it a little quieter. I like somebody that's going to say, shh. You know, there's nice ways and mean ways to do it, but give me the information. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm bad. And I'm always, my mind's going that I'm always two more steps down the road into the problem. So someone, that mean? someone being obnoxious at a movie theater and talking behind you. And I would never turn around to say it any other way other than it's my problem almost. I'm going to turn around and be like, hey, man, like, please. That's great. Like, please, please, would you? It's like, it's just like you're talking a lot and I'm, it's just interrupting the movie. I, if someone did that to me in a movie theater, like you said, I go, I go, I'm so sorry. I didn't, yeah. That's my reaction. I believe the rest of the world goes, fuck you, dude. Turn around and mind your business. And I'm already in our fist fight in the street. Out of your control. Mind. Uh, absolutely, but it's, that's what it is. But what is funny, when I have to go in a second too, I'm sorry, yeah. man, but though this makes me laugh to your point, being the other person on that, like your story as a kid, when I started, I, I started comedy before Lewis and Dave, uh, Lewis Gomez and Jay, Jay Gomez and Dave Smith, my partners on Legion of Skanks uh, podcast. I started about eight years before them in comedy, but I never judged friends on like, can do for me or can do for them. I, the people I thought were funny that I liked to hang out with, I hung out with. And I was with them a lot, not realizing that even being in it for eight years and they're one, two year comics, they, and I'm working some clubs and yeah. everything, you know, they're like, they looked up to me, but I thought that we're just three of us are friends. Yeah. So it's great is, you know, now 17 years of friendship later on the show when it comes out sometime, 
I'm like, oh yeah, we had, they had a guitar hero at that place we were at the other day. He goes, damn, Dave, remember every day, dude, me on guitar, you on bass, just shredding those guitar hero games for hours on end. And then Lewis will be like, yeah, just, you know, Dave hates guitar hero. He doesn't like Funny. it at all. I'm like, Dave, and I, again, we're exaggerating a bit for the show. So I Dave's it. like, I didn't hate playing. It was fun, but, but it wasn't my thing. I did it because, you know, if late night it was like, should we get a, you know, if I was like, I think I want to get pizza after the show. If Dave had pizza the day before and didn't want pizza, he'd go, yeah, I would love some pizza. We're getting right pizza now. Just yeah. because he just wanted to go along. And it's funny to hear that back because I'm like, dude, I thought we were just friends because you guys, I'm like, these guys are into everything I'm into. <laughs> funny. Uh, let me really quick read this thing just because oh, of the, yeah, yeah, the point of the thing. So we're outside uh, and I'm leaving and then he starts, he keeps going and while he's going about drinks and all, I go, hey man, I don't want to be rude. It really was nice seeing you and I did love doing that show. I just got to get out of here. I'm so tired. And he, you would have thought I called him the worst names. Really? I saw this and he goes, oh yeah, don't. And when he did that, I tried one recovery. I go, no, no, please. I'm just, no, no, no I, I understand. That's fine. No, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then he went in so dramatic. And then I got a message, um, uh, 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 at whatever time, two something in the morning, um, uh, where he goes, your stand up wasn't great. Wish we were still friends. I'll leave you be now that you're a quote star. And I'm like, he's assigned you ego. Also, that's why. Wish we were still friends. I don't know. You're you. not friends. First of all. We were friendly when we met because you were friendly and you weren't friendly when I saw you now. So we're not friendly. And it was like at, at 2.45 in the morning, star, you think I left because I'm a, I'm a star? It's like, oh, Mr. Big Shot. <laughs> I left because I'm tired and you spit on me, guy. Fucking people that drink, man. Anyway, um... Yeah, let's end it. Tell me that you know the the uh, the uh, 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 where people could see you in the special. Bigjcomedy.com is all my dates. Uh, the bonfire on Faction Talk Series Sex and One Hundred Three with me and Bobby Kelly five days a week. Uh, Legion of Skanks podcast and SDR show over at Guest Digital Network and the special will be out on YouTube April fifth. Uh, Dog Belly live from Skankfest. And I'm going to ask uh, if you will lo no, known already. You would have already seen it, but I'm going to reach out either to you or the uh, your people about. Um, if you have a, a clip from your special that you wanted people to see, when yeah. we talk about it at the beginning, I'm going to throw that in. Okay, awesome. Um, I just got to get a Polaroid real quick, and then you're out. Let's do it. Nice to meet you, dude. Nice to meet you, man. This is great. Scoot do. Scoot do. Music. Doo. Great. That was fun, man. <laughs> oh, sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I just wanted to remind you, subscribe. We want to get to 200,000, and if we do, I'm going to get a shh. Don't tell. <gasps> Blabbity blue. Scoop deep.